Hi, I'm Brandon Briscoe, and welcome to another episode of The Postscript, Living Faith Bible Institute's weekly podcast and YouTube series devoted to interviewing pastors and professors from LFBI and across the Living Faith Fellowship. Each week, uh, we come together with the intention of edifying you and strengthening you, building you up, and we, we talk about all kinds of different subjects in order to do that. Each episode is kind of a reflection of some of the things that we're talking about in the Bible Institute itself, uh, things like theology, things like ministry leadership, things like uh, church history. Now, on today's episode, we're going to be having a conversation specifically about the arts, uh, about media, about faith and secularism. And, and as many of us know, that uh, Christianity itself at times uh, feels very distant from the arts. And we think about the arts and we think about, uh, you know, uh, lost people. We think about uh, indulgence. We think about uh, lost behavior, postmodern thought, secular ideas that, that, that really are counter to what we hold dear to. And so because of that, we separate ourselves and uh, we avoid uh, things that we don't understand. And so that's kind of what we're going to be talking about today. And on this episode, I have uh, my dear friend, Pastor Dan Renault of Living Faith Lee Summit. Uh, Dan is a art teacher here at one of the local colleges in Kansas City, and he has his MFA, a Master of Fine Arts. Uh, and so he's very uh, familiar with the topic of art history. And so we're going to engage today in a conversation about uh, how art history and the things that we can learn about art uh, impact and reflect upon our biblical perspectives and ideas. And so we're going to pick his brain and get more familiar with uh, some of those ideas. He also is a guest lecturer in the speech and reasoning class here at LFBI, and he goes pretty in-depth on this subject matter in that class. Dan, welcome back to the show, man. Thank you. Appreciate it's, it. It's good to have you. It's been a while. Yeah, it has. Glad to be back. It's like you're busy or something. Well, you, you can't know. come hang out. I'm here. Um, and so for, the, for those who don't really know, your church is how old now? Four and a half years old. Four and a half years old. Yeah. So, and it's growing week by week. And mm -hmm. yeah, that's good. Yeah, yeah, it's so cool. So, before we get in, this is a huge topic, obviously. We're not going to get to cover everything we want to cover today. Right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Unless your knowledge set is way lower than what I thought it was. <laughs> well, that could be true. But, yeah. <laughs> but let's just start by talking about like, um, why are people drawn to art? Why are people compelled to make art? It's a very broad kind of philosophical question that maybe doesn't have a super clear answer. But from your perspective, why do people want to make art and why do people enjoy art? Yeah, I think uh, from the very beginning, we see that, that we have God as a creator, right? And so we are prone to, to mimic that, to follow that. Um, even historically, you see that... that um, the evidences of art making throughout history have been that that man desires to create just like our God does, mm -hmm. and so um, there's a an impulse for us to be creators as well, right? And so I think that that's a telling thing. You know, it it reminds us as as people that yeah, we were also created mm -hmm. uh, by God, and so and that we're His image bearers, yeah, mm -hmm. and that we're gonna do we're gonna be prone to do things that God does, yeah, yeah, and I think you know artist as creator is, is one of the evidences of God, mm -hmm. but yet we have, instead of, of, instead of showing that, that evidence that, that yes, God does exist, that, that we are made in his image, um, we've turned to a humanistic lens mm -hmm. and in doing so, instead of, you know, showing his, his light, his glory, we've turned from him. Sure. It makes yeah. me think about the compulsion to create in Babylon. Mm -hmm. right? There was a, there's a desire to make something but it was something that glorified self versus yeah. glorify the Lord. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So let's talk about that. Like we're about to enter a, a portion of the, of the conversation today that I think is crucial for people to get an understanding of how history, uh, how secularism, how faith uh, interweave into the arts in the West throughout time. And I want us to, to give the listener a snapshot of art history in the West over the last 1,500 to 2,000 years, because I think it'll help us to get an understanding of how God's been at work and how Satan's been at work and how we ought to have a proper perspective. So if you don't mind, I just want to ask, if we were to start with medieval, the medieval time period, could we mm -hmm. slowly walk through to, to a contemporary uh, moment in time where people are making, but let's start with medieval art. Maybe you could talk to us about what was going on 
you know, it was a 500, about 500 would be when mid, the medieval. Yeah, yeah. Um, around that time, you, you were starting to see Romanesque art, uh, Byzantine style art. Um, there was a great interest in capturing what were called saints, mm -hmm. you know, St. Matthew or mm -hmm. St. Jerome or, or some other individual. Uh, it was very 2D, very flat. Mm -hmm. um, you'd have the, the individual um, with almost no resemblance of a three-dimensional you know nature to highly, their, to their highly body. stylized in very that way. stylized very iconographic mm -hmm. um and in a lot of ways uh, this is where you see notions of veneration where there's a you know some would say worship of the saints mm -hmm. some would say that the saint was being used as a vehicle to speak to god um rather than us being able to speak directly to God right. through the Holy Spirit, you know, so we, we see some problems, mm -hmm. but right. but that through veneration of the saints, you know, we would have access to the Lord. We know that there's a lot of issues with that yeah. uh, biblically, but that was kind of where we were at during that that period of time. And so there's this, um, you know, very flat kind of like a stoic figure, mm -hmm. gold backgrounds quite a bit, um, which would be a referral or a reference to uh, deity or the celestial. Mm -hmm. And so during this time, there was a, a big rejection of anything that was naturalistic. Mm -hmm. So everything was, you know, heavenly, everything was was uh, celestial and, 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 and beyond human, right? right? But then over time, um, you shift over into, and this is kind of a big jump, but uh, Gothic or even um, Renaissance mm -hmm. and Early Renaissance, Renaissance. Yeah. And, and Renaissance means rebirth, right? Right. And so, what that would be it would be a rebirth of the Roman Greco period of, you know, a thousand years earlier. Yeah, going back to what they saw as the classics. This was the end all be all, mm -hmm. the creme de la creme. You know, it was yeah. the it was it was what art, good art was. Right. And so there was, there was a rebirth in the Renaissance. Um, and so, and this is where on the surface. We start to see images of Christ on the cross, and mm -hmm. we see a lot of Christian references, and right. and it's easy to be like, well, okay, well, this is a very Christian time, but right. but in reality, Renaissance had a lot to do with naturalism mm -hmm. and syncretism. Yeah, uh, there was a blending of of you know mythology mm -hmm. with Christian themes. Uh, humanism is is really growing yeah. during Renaissance, yeah. and so what you find is you have a you have this notion of Christianity, but this conflation or this this blending of of humanistic uh, thought, mm -hmm. um, and so there's a lot to be said there. Yeah. Uh, and I don't know if you were gonna. No, so just to, I mean, just by way of maybe better framing stylistically, uh, but also in terms of conceptually. So so if you think about the early church uh, prior prior to medieval times, if we're talking about Roman and Greek time there was a great desire for strong human representation. So they would depict the natural world with great care and intention. Um, and that actually the move into more of a stylized, flatter aesthetic was not because people didn't know how to make art. Right. <laughs> Which yeah. is, I think, the viewer's sometimes presumption is, well, they didn't know how to make depictions. We've evolved in our We've ability. We've progressed. We're Which so is, much better. It's a false perspective. It's a false narrative. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And so the reason they were doing that is because they were deifying the figures that they were portraying in those early medieval they, they, they weren't human. depictions. Right. Uh, which is one of the big issues with Christ, uh, yeah. even just historically. Mm -hmm. uh, he was definitely divine, but he wasn't human. Right, 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 and so so there was definitely um, issues with that uh, in church yeah, history. Yeah, yeah. There's theological, there's which which theological followed. implications in the aesthetic itself. And so yeah. people were very very conceptual mm -hmm. uh, before the Renaissance, um, and so things were not. It wasn't an issue of like, well, we just don't know how to paint people. Right. right? Um, it was more that things were gearing more towards a conceptual bent. Mm -hmm. uh, but then with the Renaissance, just like everything is, is a teeter totter. All of a sudden, there was more of a need to to find an observational. Uh, position, and so, but with that, as much as we might want, we might have wanted to say like, oh, well, now it, th this is like Christianity, like, yeah, like through the roof. Yeah, there was a lot of give and take. There was a lot of things that were being put into that. A lot mm -hmm. of superstition, right, and a lot of uh, mythology that was, right. I mean, just interwoven, um, which became a reflection of, if you want to call it, Christian thought of the day. Mm -hmm. um, definitely Catholic thought. Sure. Uh, where superstition was was definitely um, in the forefront. Yeah. So we, what we see from about 500 to 1500 is a constant melding of uh, uh, Christianity 
and paganism uh, that had preceded Christianity in Rome, this melding together becomes Catholic superstition. Uh, mm -hmm. And there's an aesthetic that is almost purely Catholic. Why is it that Catholics dominated art through the medieval and Renaissance time frame? Why is it that their theological voice is coming through? And then how did that manifest itself? So when we talk about art, where was the art at? Uh, who owned art? There wasn't really an art market per se, but there was art being produced with intention. I don't know if I can answer that fully, right? Just um, give us a general. Yeah, I would say, you, you know, history now doesn't want to talk about the dark ages, right? Mm -hmm, we, right. We, we want to use different terms. Sure. But um, from a Christian perspective, one of the things that you see is that during this time, um, the Bible was not being made available. Mm -hmm. um, in, in a large degree. And so rather than people having access to the scriptures, uh, people were being, you know, either forced or compelled to listen to church dogma, which became obviously the Catholic church. Mm -hmm. And so in a lot of ways, the Catholic church began to rule in a very political way, um, not to go into the weeds in this, but a very kingdom of heaven mm -hmm. context, yeah. which would be physical in nature, which is where we have the crusades. Mm -hmm. And the Inquisition, which is just yeah. jacked. Right. It's not Christian. Right. It, it has nothing to do with Christianity. It has everything to do with ruling on this earth and, and making nation states mm -hmm. that would be, quote, Christian in nature. Yeah. But so I don't know if that's an answer or not. But you know, when we shift out of out of Renaissance, which is a, a gradual shift, we enter into the Baroque. Mm -hmm. And one of the things about the Baroque is that um, man, it was happening during the Reformation. And the Baroque was very didactic. It was very theatrical. It was very um, gruesome and and intense. Mm -hmm. um, Michelangelo, yeah. uh, you know, Caravaggio uh, were artists during this time, and uh, very extreme color, extreme uh, what would be High called contrast tenebrism, which would be this this extreme chiaroscuro, which would be this this sharp value contrast mm -hmm. that you're speaking of. And so, but the Baroque time period, you know, great story, cool, whatever. But the Baroque is really about the counter-reformation where the mm -hmm. catholic church was saying wait a second where, where are you guys going and so they were using these extreme uh well propaganda really yeah, right. to get people to come back right uh to scare people back to intimidate people back or to, to just play on their just, emotions absolutely to yeah. wow people back yeah. you know and so the catholic church was using their resources to create a movement and by all means it was beautiful mm -hmm. it's a really engaging right. time in art history but it absolutely has a context. It's not mm -hmm. just like, well, let's make things really contrasted now. Yeah. Let's make things really sharp and, and, and bold. They were trying to be very forceful. Yes. Whereas Renaissance was idealistic. It was naturalistic. It was humanistic. It was- it And it was, was art for the people. Yeah, and, yeah. and it was humanist. It, it was humanism, you right. know, and, and let, but let's connect it with Christianity. And mm -hmm. so it was very pleasing, very idealistic. Yeah. Figures were, were perfect. Mm -hmm. with, the, with the Baroque, figures are, I mean, they're they're intense, right? It's it's very strong, um, and it's uh, intimidating at times. Yeah, and you use the word propaganda, and I think it's important for us to know is that art has at, at almost all stages and varying degrees been a way of promoting ideas. Mm -hmm. It's a form of communication, and especially in the medieval time periods and moments in Renaissance art making, what you have is a very strong uh, uh, m movement to to convince the people, the masses, that the Catholic Church is the most sacred. Mm -hmm. And that if you want access to God, this is this is actually where you'll find it. And the imagery was intended to provoke inside in, in people's hearts a desire to get closer to the church and to trust the the dogmatism of the day. Well and, and you know, not trying to pick a fight right now, but but salvation is found in the church. Mm -hmm. That's the that's yeah, the that's the perspective. That's the doctrine. Right. Um and you know if you were to leave the church then you are putting yourself in a position of of damnation. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a scary thing. And yeah. so why would I want to do that you yeah. know, for a hunch that maybe the church is a little bit messed up? Yeah. Maybe the church is messed up, but that's the way to salvation. Sure. Right, right, right. So that's, People are willing to look past that stuff. Well, yeah, yeah. And indulgences, and we could talk about the economy behind this, but indulgences paid the way for greater and greater art, greater and greater architecture, particularly you mentioned the Gothic time period moving into the Baroque time period, which is very flamboyant, mm -hmm. very loud, very, um, again, it's a way of promoting the power, the authority, mm -hmm. and the divine nature of, quote unquote, the Catholic Church. But there was no there was no authority to stand behind besides the, the dogma. And so 
w what was really superstition, mm -hmm, you know? Exactly. And that's how we get to Rococo, yeah. which is um, a huge departure. Mm -hmm. You know, we're, we're talking about now, because the church has become, I say the church, I mean, the Catholic church has become so superstitious in nature um, and, you know, propagandistic, um, you know, extreme in some ways, but not biblically extreme, mm -hmm. you know, not like where we would go, right. hey, let's stand for something. Not like a yeah. different kind of radical. Yeah, right. Um, the world finally goes, no thanks. Yeah. Scientific method comes about, uh, empirical evidence. Mm -hmm. If I can't taste it, touch it, smell it, feel it, throw it, whatever, it, I don't care. Right. Uh, the age of enlightenment mm -hmm. comes about. Mm -hmm. And at this point, with all of these things, you know, coming about, um, and Rococo would be a, a French movement, but um, what happens is, is, is people say, you know what, I think we're done. Mm -hmm. And so we go from Renaissance, which would be this idealistic, naturalistic, religious humanism. Right. We then go into this very strong didactic kind of nature of Baroque. And now we're in Rococo, which is, man, if, if, if Baroque was trying to tell you something, like I'm going to yeah. teach you a lesson. Right. Rococo was like, man, just stick around. Let's, it, let's let's have some fun. Yeah, it's secularism's response to the Baroque, and it's even Absolutely. louder and more flamboyant. It, it oh, yeah. kind of it's, ups the ante in every way. Yeah. The, the the flesh is fleshier, and and you know yeah. the the skin tones are pinker, and everything is yeah, just. I mean, sure. it's 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 out there. It, it's hedonism, and, right. and and so everything becomes very sensual. And the reason why is because if we have removed God, right, and, and we're thinking about, we're getting close to that kind of. Nietzsche kind of conversation. Yes, yeah. If if we have killed God, if we've removed God, then I can kind of do mm -hmm. whatever I want. Mm -hmm. And so you see that you you see in Baroque, there's this kind of fearful notion. Um, whereas with but but it's it's through superstition, and so people it doesn't work. Right. Surprise, surprise, it doesn't work. It's not based. It's upon, not actual Christianity. It's not. There's nothing in. There's nothing to hold on to. Yeah. It's just fear. It's fear mm -hmm. tactics. Mm -hmm. And so what happens is people get tired of that and they turn to the world, and and it kind of makes sense. Mm -hmm. And so we get Rococo, which is, man, you know, fun time. Right. It's and play. So, so to frame, you know, Rococo is really at that the cusp of enlightenment. And what's happening is uh, French philosophers are dominating the scene. Mm -hmm. uh, America gets established. Um, the the um, Enlightenment thought is in, infused with this idea of p pioneering the new world, democracy, establishing a republic. There's all these wonderful new philosophical ideas that are coming out of that time frame, And then this thing called Romanticism takes place, which is... Um, you know, transcendental in nature. It's very mm -hmm. naturalistic. And there's this kind of turning back. The Roco People get tired of the Rococo a little bit. It's like it's you get worn out. P partying gets tired. Yeah, yeah. You can't keep it up. Right. Yeah. So there's this desire work, to get actually. back to, to seeing the earth and seeing the world and understanding our place in the world. Maybe you can describe romanticism for us. Just well, it's bit. very emotional, but it's emotional in a different way. Mm -hmm. Whereas Rococo is emotional in a sensual way. Um, romanticism was an emotional in, a, in a, a, a longing way. Yeah. And it was a longing back for, for nature or back for relationship or, right. or, and even in a weird way, you can see some connections to neoclassicism, mm -hmm. which is, which is around the same time, mm -hmm. um, to a better day. Yeah. To, There's to more a, stability. And, yeah. and in fact, you know, just the way Romans chapter one tells us that nature itself reveals the personage of God. And I think in some ways, romanticism was a step that direction. It was like, we want to acknowledge there's something that's bigger than us. You know, we're not the end all be all. We're actually beginning to realize that there's something bigger, there's something grander, there's something to be explored. There's mm -hmm. a, there's a there's discovery on the horizon that we have not as yet humanity, without going to the degree. without going far enough. Yeah. And yeah. that's where honestly when you think of uh the transcendentalists, that's where we get new thought. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's where that's where new thought comes about and that's right. that's where we start having some of these these new religions which which eastern religion had had this yes construct for a long time yeah. that's now with you know whether it's trade or whether it's just the, the world's getting smaller we're starting to see those things start to enter into right. the western right. world and america interesting though 
And all of it aesthetically is still very, very naturalistic, very realistic. Observational, painting. very um, observational. We would all look at it and say, well, that's exceptionally detailed. Uh, the, the use of color, the use of the understanding of space and environment and perspective and all these things would be very We impressive. would call it good art. Yeah, yeah. The, that, that, that's because, and, and, and I always say this in my, in my classes where, where, where I teach at, mm -hmm. at school, um, there's a reason for it. For 500 years, we that's all we've ever seen from Renaissance to now that right. we've just we've been conditioned to to appreciate representational art. Mm -hmm. uh, and so to a certain degree, that's kind of what we've always viewed as as good, right. as strong, as right. right. Yeah. Um, and yet what we find is that that begins to shift. Yes. And so let's talk about that shift. So in the mid 1800s, um, the invention, the invention of the camera, it was first, you know, the cam camera obscura, which was a process of photography. But then the, the, the daguerreotype was invented mm -hmm. and then mass produced. And so by the 1850s, mm -hmm. uh, there was a proliferation of easy access cameras. You order them through the whatever it was, Montgomery Ward catalog, and it'd be shipped to your house in a crate. And, and people began to get cameras, which changed the perspective on art. Explain to us that shift in art making that came after the invention of the camera. Well, I mean, if you think about it, if I were the artist and I was wanting to paint your family and you were going to pay me um, a certain amount, um, I was now out of a job right? because you who were paying for that resource were now realizing like, wait a second, I can, I can have this magical thing called a camera. It can, right. and it can capture me and my family in, and it was, it wasn't moments like we understand today, but, but it was a, a very short amount of time. Mm -hmm. to where you, so all of a sudden the artist was out of a job in, in some right. ways. And so the art artist and, and the art world had to kind of recreate itself. Mm -hmm. um, Picasso would be one of the, the the first who would kind of understand that. Um, he would say, you know, we, we can see what the camera has done. Now we realize what art is not. Right. Like, like art can be all of these other things. And so what we find, and I'm, I don't know if I'm explaining this very well, but with the invention of the camera, the need for the artist had to take a shift, yeah. you know? And so artwork became less focused on representation and it started to become mm -hmm. more focused on on concept. Yeah. And with uh, that, you think like, I, I think that there was a, still a semblance of the artist as artisanal. In other words, a, a, a craft maker. Um, and I think all of that dies when we enter this new era where the, the art, the artisan becomes the artist, autonomy, freedom, <clears throat> liberty to make focus, a higher focus on creativity versus uh, maybe cultural or societal pressure to make a particular thing. And, and, and the way we talk about it right now, it, we're, we're making it seem like it was a very easy shift. No, people, people said that Picasso was, was, was committing career suicide. Right. Uh, anyone who studies Picasso knows that when he was 15, if you look at First Communion, if, if, if you want to look mm -hmm. that up, I mean, at 15 years old, he's painting something that many of us could never even touch. Right. Um, he was he was gifted. Yeah. And, and so all of a sudden he starts painting things and, and kind of crude shapes and forms, yeah. which is the invention of, of cubism, with right? He and Brock color and distortions, every, yeah. well, there's a fragmentation, mm -hmm. but, but there's a reason for the fragmentation. Hey, thank you so much for listening to the show. We're going to pause right here for just a second. So we can hear from one of our students from the living faith Bible Institute. Hi, my name is Carly Weber and I am a student at LFBI. LFBI has consistently been used of the Lord to meet me where I'm at in whatever season and to draw me closer to Him. Every class that I've taken so far has very distinct takeaways that I counsel from, that I look back on, that have changed my relationship with the Lord. He is using it to mold me into the woman of God who He needs me to be to get His work done. And through that, I'm learning how to discern better in the world that I live in, how to better understand the world that I live in, um, and how to how to fight with with my weapon, the Word of God, um, in this battle that's all spiritual uh, and none physical. I will look back on these classes for the rest of my life. To enroll for classes, visit lfbi.org. To support LFBI, please visit lfbi.org slash support. But there's a reason for the fragmentation. And, and at first, the world is going like, what are you doing? But what he's 
recognizing and what a lot of other artists are recognizing, which would be in the, in the mid 1800s, which would be realism, impressionism, impressionism. even post impressionism, then mm -hmm. leading up to cubism is that what, what the artist or the artisan was always was now shifting. There was a, mm -hmm. there was a new opportunity, not that it was a death knell. It was, it was an opportunity for art to become something new. Yeah. Now that was not accepted. I mean, impressionism was a word that was given by its critics. Yeah. It wasn't like a, Oh, that's a cool thing. They're and they were making... they were focused. They were forced out of the mainstream artistic scene. The academy, yeah, yeah which would be you know the the, the French academy. You they were looked like you know it was ridiculous. It was like the artist certification of of, of Europe. Really. Well, the guilds you know were, were still huge mm -hmm. back then, and, and that's not something that we wouldn't recognize now. But yeah, so so impressionism, even a, a, another art movement called Fauvism, mm -hmm. uh, that means wild beast. In yeah, French, right. the critics called them wild beasts. Right. And so there was definitely not an acceptance of this new type of, of art, but throughout history now, the canon of art, art history recently would suggest that, man, if a camera can, can take the picture of the individual, then what's the point of the artist? Yeah. And so art then shifted. Right. So let's fast forward. Obviously we're not doing any of this justice, but it's good for the listeners to kind of catch an overall view. Uh, take us up to World War I. Um, you've already mentioned some artists that kind of overlap World mm -hmm. War I, uh, but there's, there's particular things that are happening that go even beyond art into performance, um, into the surreal and absurd. And so when we get into World War I, there's something that's almost uh, out, even outside of what Van, Van Gogh or, or Picasso would Matisse even recognize. Picasso like or, it just goes beyond even or, thing, anything they would have expected yeah. happening. Explain Dadaist and all that stuff. Well, okay, so, so Picasso mm -hmm. is important though. Um, Absolutely. Because, and, and because of cubism and, and the fragmentation of the self, and I, I think sometimes, and, and maybe this is getting too much into the weeds of art history, but I think it is healthy for people, especially Christians to understand how art history has as a way of of touching on yes. where history is heading, mm -hmm. and, I, and I think I think that's where we're trying to go with this. Yes. Is that he didn't start making blocky figures because it was like, oh shucks, I don't know what I'm doing anymore. Right. He, we we already know that that he was able of making great paintings. Mm -hmm. When he started painting that way, I mean, think about World War One. Think about the just. The whole world is falling apart. Yeah, I mean, it is. It's breaking down. Everything that we understood with with agriculture and that way of thinking has now been shifted with the industrial revolution, mm -hmm. and now with industrialism. And and you know, uh, no longer are our dads going to the farm with the family. Yeah, dads are going to the assembly line. So there's right. a, there's a breakdown of the family. There's a breakdown of the self. With with the assembly line, I'm not making the whole product. I might be. Focused on you're a cog in the wheel. I, I'm, I might put the light on, right? And so there's this fragmentation of the self, and so artists are starting to think about those things rather than just observational painting. They're starting to make a, a commentary on this. Yeah, it's well, a reflection of the state of being. It is a reflection, and art is always a reflection of man's ideas. Mm -hmm. That that is absolutely something that is important to understand. I, I speak about that in, in in speech and reasoning. Yeah, is that art is a reflection of man's ideas, whether you like it or not. Right. Whether whether it makes you uncomfortable, maybe it feels creepy. It is a reflection of our times, and mm -hmm. that is something that as Christians we better get our head around. Mm -hmm. And so you have you have cubism, but you also have something that's called Dadaism. Yeah. And or Dada and surrealism. And man, this is where things start to get like. Goofy. I mean, yeah. like, like out there performances yeah. where, where guys are just going like blah, 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 you know, yeah. just weird kind of like not making any sense. Right. And, and people are going to these, these, you know, bars and clubs and these places uh, to watch these performances. And, uh, and it's, it's nonsense. Yeah. And the world knew it was nonsense. Even the artisans that were a part of this. It was the point. That was the point. Yeah. It's like, well, if the world is going crazy, Let's just be a demonstration. Let's be a reflecting yeah. pool of of the world, and so with Dadaism, you know, you have these performances, which never really you, you didn't see a lot of that. Um, people were using strange costumes and odd behavior, mm -hmm. um, and so yeah, Dadaism was absolutely this reflection. It was, hey, if if the world is falling apart, let's 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 be a mirror, right? And that's only compounded when we get to World War II. And really what we would maybe describe as the destruction of, of painting or how we understand painting in general. Maybe you can talk through 
the influence of World War II on men like de Koenig and Pollock and what was to come at the middle of the last century? Yeah, I mean, you know, and this is a hard thing to maybe explain on a, on a surface level, but um, all of a sudden artists are no longer painting people. They're no longer painting landscapes and still lifes. Um, and art is coming to the end of itself. Mm -hmm. And to where, to where you have like Ad Reinhardt in, in Kansas City, you can go to the Nelson, you can see a painting that is just a bunch of black squares. Yeah. You can see Paula who has just a bunch of splattered paint. Mm -hmm. You see the absence of the self. The self is gone. There's no figure. There's no tree. There's no house. There's no chimney. There's yeah. no mountain. There's none of these things. It, there's not even an abstract representation of those. There's things. not even a representation of something. Right. Now the soul is gone. Mm -hmm. it, the, it's, the it's, void. it's a nihilism. Yeah. We've entered into, and this is where this is where the world has taken us. Mm -hmm. Again, if art is a reflection, and we're getting to Pollock and. and well, that's just crazy. He's just splattering paints. Yeah, that's Any, anybody could do that. Like this the is, real yeah. world could do that. And so we, and, and I get it. I get it. You know, and the art world didn't do any any favors when it when it like you know right went down this path. But but let's be honest. This is this is the reflection of where the mm -hmm. world is going. And so when you have people that are painting black squares, and when you have people who are who are you know splattering uh, paint, it's because there's this you know end of self. Yeah. There's this this you know the soul right this. It's this vanquishing of the self. It's, yeah. So when you think about Pollock or when you think about de Kooning or, you know, Reinhardt or all these figures, mm -hmm. it, it shouldn't be a surprise that, that this is where we find ourselves. Right. Um, not only they, but but our whole world has has been this. We've been on a collision course mm -hmm. to where, you know, we're, we're ending with this nihilistic thought and, and not a surprise, but many of those artists committed suicide, you know, and, and many, of the, to death, many right. of the philosophers right. of that time, even French philosophers of the 60s and 70s saw that the end was yeah. not what they hoped. Right. So anyway, so that's that's like the 50s and, and mm -hmm. leading into the 60s. And that kind of brings us into the, you know, sexual revolution. And uh, art was definitely on on board for that and, yeah. and leading the way. And and when we say art, I think it's important that we also speak of media. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, not only do we think of paintings or things like that, but but all of media. And we have the introduction of the TV. Yeah, we have the proliferation of of magazines. We have we have uh, the uh, ability for imagery to be present in our lives. Yeah, in a manner that was that was just not available. Right before um, World War II. Before or... it, maybe in between that, yeah. you have you have newspapers and magazines and all of this availability of, of, of imagery. And sure enough, because man is, is sensual in nature and, yeah. and, you know, we, we desired that, yeah. uh, it found its way into, you know, popular culture, uh, in the 1960s, you have pop art, mm -hmm. which, uh, basically means popular. And so it was a, it was a refusal to focus on the Napoleons or, the, the Jesuses, yeah, right? The, yeah. Everything that was seen holy or, or um, you know, high. Right. We're going to make paintings and prints of SpaghettiOs. Yeah, it was a way of bringing back the icon into imagery, the, a figure or a subject, but ha keeping it in the absurd versus the the significance of a human figure that has obviously this, that soulishness mm -hmm. um, that's still absent. But in some ways, uh, instead of focusing on Christ, we focus on Marilyn Monroe, mm -hmm. you know, Joe yeah. DiMaggio. Yeah. Uh, and so there is, even though through the 50s, we go through this tortured artist self where right. there's this, this nihilistic view of the self. Um, now when the self comes back in in the 60s, and again, it's always a teeter-totter, mm -hmm. it's a celebration of, of JFK. It's a celebration of a baseball player, mm -hmm. a model. Mm -hmm. um, and so with popular culture and, and pop art, we see that there's a celebration of me. Yeah, not of of kings and queens and of 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 Christ, right? Of anything that would be worthy of celebration. Now it's mm -hmm. a celebration of self. Sure. Um, even if it's vacuous, mm -hmm. even if it's empty, even if we are just a bunch of spaghettios. It was actually honest, though. Well, yes, it was. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. It's it's where yeah. we were. It's it's where we are. You know. Yeah. We're still bright we're still colors, shiny. Yep. Plastic, fancy. Yeah. So. So talk to us about how that time frame uh, moves us into today what we refer to as postmodernism. And obviously, again, we're leaving out so many small, minor, fractured movements that here and there, we, just, we don't have time to get into that. But how do we move from the 60s uh, and the 70s up in today from, from 
the sexual revolution and those ch the challenging of the norms, visual norms, aesthetic norms, uh, societal norms, and we move into what we understand to be postmodernism. Well, you know, people talk about modernism. People mm -hmm. talk about postmodernism. People want to talk about post postmodernism at times. Mm -hmm. um, and there's never really a, a, and now the door is closed, right? It, there's always this kind of weird, slow shift from modernism to postmodernism. And uh, one could say that modernism started back in the 1850s, 1830s. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, one could even argue that postmodernism started in the 1910s with, with Marcel Duchamp's, you know, yeah, the Dada urinal, guys. this yeah. piece called Fountain, mm -hmm. um, with Dada, yeah. yeah. Um, but what we do find is that whereas modernism was focused on this, you know, high authority and this avant-garde, Mm -hmm. And, you know, the arts were, were different than the rest of the world. Let's separate ourselves from, from the world. It was very elite. It was academic. Yes. Um, yeah. Intellectual. Mm -hmm. uh, they separated themselves from the world. And so that, that was my point earlier is, is when the world all of a sudden says, you guys aren't making sense. Well, that's because they, the arts separated themselves yeah. completely from the world. And then when they came back, like, well, here, we're here. The world is going, well, this doesn't make any sense, right? Right. So anyway, modernism is this like high reaching tower of academia and, and intellect. Postmodernism is the exact opposite. Now they're both secular, completely secular mm -hmm. in, in their content. But postmodernism is like this sprawling suburb of thought and it's very collective, which which obviously we see today. Mm -hmm. But but we need to know, and, and I think this is healthy for us, that that postmodernism in its like if we want to call it a birth, that's like 1960s. Mm -hmm. I mean, collectivism, uh, collaboration, uh, this this refusal of absolutes, yeah, where absolutes are negotiable. Yeah, you have an yeah, absolute re relativism. Okay. Yeah, exactly. We have relativism. We, we have pluralism, and some of the sometimes people use those words There's interchangeably There's with, with postmodernism. But we have this collective, and so now rather than looking for truth or an absolute, what's more important is do we agree? Mm -hmm. And so, so I, I'm I'm more concerned with just can we all be have a consensus? So consensus is more important than than truth. Mm -hmm. And you find that, and it sounds like we're having like a philosophical conversation right now. This is the art world. Yeah, the art world is is less interested in honestly even making art. Now yeah. it's it's more interested in speaking art. It's right. it's interested in. in Artist as social agent, mm -hmm. artist as as activist, right? And so now um, the 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 big movers and shakers that we see even today, who would even call themselves artists, spend more time uh, working through social issues, and yeah. that's what they're more known for. Uh, well, that didn't happen by accident. It wasn't mm -hmm. like, well, shucks, so and so just wanted to be, you know, a social agent instead. No, nope. yeah, right. th this has been the the angle. Mm -hmm. It's why you see artists now that are that are you know, DJs and architects and chefs, your you are, identity is fluid, yeah. which shocker. Now right. we're, we're, we're no longer speaking about the things that we do. Not only am I an architect, but I'm also an artist and a DJ and a chef, mm -hmm. right? That, that used to be the, the norm at, in, in the sense that, that my, my activity was fluid. Well, now we've, we've continued with that thought to yeah. where we, we've actually referred to now my being is fluid. Yeah. I now look at myself from from outside myself, mm -hmm. which surprisingly we have people that are dealing with, you know, um, what is it, dysphoria or, mm -hmm. you know, yep. where they, they feel that they, they, they Con it's can't confusion. even understand who they are. Yeah. Well, we've taught them right. to look at the world like that, to where mm -hmm. you don't know who you are. I recognize myself as they, right. as plural or as something beyond me. And so, the fluidity of our occupation has now drawn to the fluidity of our identity. Yeah. So the man, okay. So we're at this moment where I think it's important for, for us to be able to recap because you covered 1500 years of history in like 20 minutes or so, but it was good. It gave us some insight. If there's a string, if there's something that, that, that ties all of this together, could you summarize, um, art, the history of art in a way that helps us to better understand, uh, for lack of a better terms, what Greg Axe refers to as a, as a chess match between, between Christ and, and Satan and secularism and Christian faith. Can you, because like we said earlier in the introduction, there is a 
clearly a fear. There's clearly uh, Christianity has had a tenuous relationship with the arts, um, sometimes completely removed, com sometimes completely sucked in. And if you could summarize for us all of that time frame in terms of that chess match or that battle for truth, how would you put that? How would you explain that to us? Well, I, I think if we as Christians recognize that art is a language, that it's, that it's a way that the world has been trying to communicate. Mm -hmm. And I even say this when I'm teaching art. I, I say that, that um, the reason why you make art is because you can't say it. And that might sound super hippy dippy, but I, I think it's actually important that, that mm -hmm. sometimes, you know, I can't put it in words, but maybe I'm gonna paint it or maybe I'm gonna write it in poetry down or maybe mm -hmm. I'm gonna do something else. And, and the world is, is looking with its music, with its media, with, with its commercials, with, with every way. It's trying to communicate. Yeah. Um, we might not like it. We might not like what we hear. Mm -hmm. um, but if we as Christians realize that when the world speaks through their art, through the, through the movies, I mean, think about all the Marvel movies that are out now and, and all the, the, you know, supernatural kind of tendencies and, and, and it's a religion mysticism <laughs> it's and a religion satanism that's yeah. present in these sure. these movies oh that was just stan lee yeah oh, it was just, just it was just some guy who just was, was a comic a book writer yeah you know no this is this is the world trying to respond to what they're seeing right and the world is growing increasingly spiritual in fact that's one of the things we, we didn't talk about but that's transmodernism that's that's mm -hmm. probably where we're heading some people call it post postmodernism Whereas modernism and postmodernism were, were very secular in nature, we see a new movement. Mm -hmm. It's still a modernistic movement. Um, it's based upon sustainability. It's based upon you know nature um, and all these things, but it's really based upon spirituality, mm -hmm. not the spirituality that we grew up with, um, but one of neo pagan thought, new thought, uh, new age mysticism. Yeah. Um, so we see a lot of it: charged sure. crystals, sure, all these types of things mm -hmm. that, that are that are happening. Uh, Wicca is, is becoming, you know, more and more uh, present. Yeah. Uh, mainstream, if you will. <clears throat> so anyway, um, the world is trying to speak. It's trying yeah. to say something. Yeah. And we can either stop up our ears. Right. Which or, is, we can, uh, or we can engage it at a level that's appropriate, which is hard for us to navigate sometimes because, because we do get afraid. It's hard to understand. So because it's hard to understand, we we remove ourselves completely and now we've lost our ability to engage with the lost yeah. right so how do we get that how do we get that how do we get to a place where we're effective ministers where we're separate from the world but we also live in the world as you're talking the only thing i can think about is how many of of our friends use facebook as this like punching bag for mm -hmm. everything they don't like mm -hmm. um or instagram or or whatever it is and I just kind of want to say, put social media down. You know, let's we we have to begin trying to engage with with the people that we that we say we love. Yeah, we have to begin engaging with people that we may disagree with. Yeah, but it's like, why are we here? Aren't we ambassadors? Aren't, aren't weren't we called to reach the world for the gospel? Um, and so maybe I need to stop making fun of, you know, LGBTQ plus and all that. Maybe I need to stop making fun of you know, this and that. Mm -hmm. Maybe you need to stop making fun of what I don't understand. And I'm not saying that, you know, maybe you just need to understand everything. Well, that, that would take me forever. I'm not right. talking yeah, about, we you, need to, you can't we be need an to expert. get our, exactly. Right. We need to get our head in the book. But as we, as we choose to love Christ, and as we choose to love the body of Christ and the world, I think that changes our heart. Yeah. And so then I have a heart for, for the people that aren't like me. And so then I, I grieve when I see how the world is representing themselves or, even trying to represent Christianity. I mm -hmm. grieve for it, but yeah, I want to reach that people. Not yeah, so your inclination is no longer uh, hatred, fear-mongering. It's to engage. And so like, it's almost like there should be a polarity as strangers We're different. and pilgrims. We're we peculiar. Different. There should be a polarity of ideology. There should be a polarity of faith. But the problem is that because of that, we use that as a justification to have polarity of proximity. Like, we're not, we're no longer close to the lost. We've separated ourselves. We don't even know how to engage them. And they seem, they, because they seem otherworldly, we decide to treat them as otherworldly, which I don't know is that if that's what Paul would have done. No, no, he didn't. He, right. he consistently was reaching out. Um, I mean, how many places did he go? 
Can you imagine all the places that he went that he that he had no he, he had no idea what Corinth was like. He had mm-hmm. no idea what Ephesus was like. He had no and he walks into these places. He could have easily thought, well, this place is crazy. Yeah. I'm getting out of here. They, they can they can all die. Yeah, Athens is the great example. Oh my goodness. Right? So yes. it was first time in Athens. He goes by himself. He's not with the other disciples. He was probably shell shocked. Yeah. Yes. And yet, what was his response? Yeah. He was grieved. Yep. He was grieved for the city. Mm-hmm. And I think we've we've lost a semblance of that because we're afraid of what we see in arts and media and culture. We're afraid. Well, and 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 you know, this is probably not the right direction, but we also get behind our politics, mm-hmm. and and we become more political than than spiritual. Mm-hmm. And you know, I'm probably going to upset some people with this, but um, I I refuse to hide behind you know some type of political agenda. Um, I'm not going to let, let allow that to get in the way of me being able to communicate to someone who may completely disagree with me in so right. many levels. Right. And but I'm going to let that be the thing that deters. Yeah. Not not some nationalistic pride or, or some type of other thing. I'm, I'm not going to let those things get in the way. Right. Let the gospel divide. My goodness. I, yeah. I, like, why would you let anything else? Yeah. So I don't know. I'm, you know, it's that's that's super good. Uh, but I do want I, I do want you to to maybe continue to give us clarity in terms of how do we as Christians how are we consumers of arts and media? How can we be consumers in this world, but yet be moderate in our approach? And obviously, there's there's a lot of nuance in that. There's got to be conviction. The spirit has to be involved. We understand that we have liberty, um, right? All things are lawful. Not everything's expedient. But can you walk us through what it looks like to be a Christian that lives in this world and, and is yet separate? Well, I mean, I think of even this show right now, we're, mm-hmm. we're using media, mm-hmm. um, you know, or other, you guys have shows at Midtown and in, in, the, in the basement and you allow different, you know, artists, yeah. To, yeah, artists to display, to yeah. uh, you know, how they're, re, re, you know, they're reflecting what they're thinking about with the Lord. And mm-hmm. I think there's awesome opportunities for us to not, to not disengage, but to engage with the arts, mm-hmm. uh, to speak to people. And in ways to where our testimony will will be able to bear witness with someone, because mm-hmm. that is really what the arts can be. They can be a testimony, yeah. You know, and maybe a person's not convicted of their sin, and so maybe they're not going to allow you to go to Romans Road, right? But maybe yeah. they you you can use the arts. Maybe mm-hmm. you can u- use music. Maybe you can use your own testimony to engage with the lost to create dialogue. They're yeah. speaking. Yeah. And How so, do we speak back on common ground? Well, let's just run away. Right. You know, and so I think that there are opportunities. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you and I will both probably agree with this. We're we're both artists. We were art teachers. And the, the longer I'm here and the more I follow Christ, I'm just not as interested in, right. in the arts. It doesn't yeah. really hold my sway. Yeah. I love the arts. I, I'm I I'm, I'm in, I enjoy it. I'm interested in it, but but man, that stuff. So when you say like being a consumer of the arts. It doesn't do as much for me, yeah. but at the same time, man, I want to still be able to to engage with the lost. And and I I, I opened to this earlier, but but First Corinthians uh, seven, um, it says, uh, where is it? First Corinthians seven, speaking about you know marriage and mm-hmm. and you know having a wife and not having a wife. But I right. love I love what verse thirty one says, and it says, and they that use this world as not abusing it for the fashion of this world passeth away. Mm-hmm. If we have that focus, that yeah, yeah, the arts, they're humanistic in nature. Mm-hmm. It's gonna pass away. It's like grass that just burns up. Right. But if we can realize that this world that God has given us, could we use it? Right. Could, could we use it for his glory? Not to abuse it, not to consume it upon my lust, but can I use the arts? Can I use it? You know, well, yeah, I think so. Mm-hmm. Um, and for those who maybe aren't interested in the arts in that manner, well, well maybe you can still find ways to engage. Yeah. Um, or, and again, if arts are speaking, it's culture, it's a social dialogue, it's philosophy. It's the idea that, that it's important for us, if we're going to have a worldview that we actually understand, it's important for us to understand the counter view. Like we don't, we can't fully even exhaust what we actually believe ourselves mm. and we to, until we know what the antithetical view is. And so when we engage with the lost world at some level, uh, and, and even not as a consumer, just as a, a viewer, an observer, um, I think it helps us better understand who we are as believers. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And I don't think that's difficult. No. I, I think it requires us to, you know, when we read things, when we see things, when we 
hear about a music video that seems so perverse and and, and mm-hmm. disturbing. It doesn't mean you have to watch it, right? right? But, wow, well, I wonder why they wanted to do that. Yeah. To, to where we have a, a heart to where we want to engage with with the lost instead of let's let's isolate completely. Yeah. Let's completely isolate. Well, we are becoming the, the same Christians, if we want to call it that, that started making monasteries. Mm-hmm. Why, do we, why did they make monasteries? Because they wanted to be holy. As if holiness comes from separating yourself. Right. So I'm going to be holy because I'm going to, sep- I'm going to isolate myself from the world. The world is bad. Right. The right. world is so bad. We all know that. Yeah. So let's isolate. Mm-hmm. That's how we can stay pure. We know that that's not biblical. What would happen if someone who clearly comes from a different ideological background, a lost person, comes into your service, are you engaging them? Mm-hmm. Like, or are you so separate? Is it so monastic in nature that you don't even know how to speak love? This place to is this not person? for you. Right. This is not now, for we you. We can meet somewhere else, but this place isn't for you. Right. Yeah. That'd be problematic. Which is, yeah, it's, it's a devastating thought because then the church is no longer the hospital that it needs to be. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and I think some people might might listen to this and and think, well, this doesn't really have anything to do with me. But I think it does require us to to open our eyes to see that that the arts around us are they're a f- reflecting pool mm-hmm. of the world around you. And, and the, the more you can realize that, you don't have to be some amazing person with the arts and you know everything about the arts. But just mm-hmm. the more we can open our eyes, I think it'll be helpful. Man, well, Dan, thanks for hanging out with me and having this conversation. And um, we, we want to encourage people to take the speech and reasoning class because um, it's it's a step towards better understanding the lostness of our world and, and these secular yeah. ideas. So thanks for hanging out, dude. Absolutely. I really appreciate thanks it. Thanks for having me. And we want to thank you as well, the listener, uh, for hanging out with us for another episode of The Postscript. And if this conversation interested you at all and it was fascinating, uh, consider visiting lfbi.org. Dan is one of the guest lecturers in a class we call Speech and Reasoning uh, that we offer um, every other year. We offer this class. And so you need to keep an eye out for it when it pops back up into the cycle of courses. But but also there's other classes akin to this, classes like apologetics, uh, classes like world history, er, er, religious history and, and, and world religions, and other classes that deal with other perspectives, other lost perspectives. And it helps us as Christians to better get uh, an understanding of who we are in light of these false or fallacious ideas. And so uh, engage with the lost, engage with people that you don't understand, better, better understand them so that you can be like Paul, you can be all things to all people that you might win some. Uh, our heart has to be towards the mission and we have to get close to lost people if we're going to reach them. And so we want to encourage you in that way. We love you. And again, we're so grateful that you're hanging out with us. If you enjoyed this episode, if you have people in your life that are fans of the arts or interested in this kind of topic, share this episode out, uh, write a review, uh, put it on your Facebook page. We really appreciate all that kind of stuff. But again, thanks for joining us. We love you. God bless. See you next week.